Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's DevOps.com webinar. We're excited that you've joined us. Our topic today is critical steps in determining your value stream management solution. And our webinar is sponsored by Plutora. My name is Mitch Ashley. I'm happy to serve as your host and moderator. A few housekeeping items before we get started. First of all, we'll be sending a link, uh, emailing a link with the recording and slides following the webinar. So you'll receive that. You can also get it up on devops.com when the webinar is posted there. Also, at the end of our webinar, we have three Amazon gift cards, $50 gift cards that we're giving away. So please stick around and find out uh, if you're one of the win winners. Now, we have a great topic today and uh, a couple great speakers. And we really want to encourage everyone to ask questions. So pop your questions into the questions tab of the GoToWebinar software. And it uh, just makes it more interactive and a lot of fun, more fun for all of us. So please ask those questions. So let's move on to our topic, critical steps in determining your value stream management solution. It's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers for today. First is Mark Hornbeek, who is an independent consultant. Now, Mark has been doing DevOps for a long time. I'll just say that. We'll leave it at that, Mark. And he also has a book that's coming out called Engineering DevOps, what will be out uh, end of October. So look for that in your favorite, your favorite online bookstore, et cetera. Mark, maybe Mark will tell us how we can get that. Also, our second speaker is Jeff Kies. He's Director of Product Marketing at Plutora. So let's get started. Jeff, I'm going to turn it over to you. Take it away. Well, thank you very much. You know, I love this topic simply because we get to bring Mark, who's been consulting with companies for quite some time, about how you implement different solutions, including how you do value stream mapping, how you do value stream management, how you implement those kind of solutions. So, Mark, you know, what's uh, how where does this fit in the series of webinars that we've done? Well, again, I just want to thank you, Jeff and Plutora, for uh, having me participate in this effort. Um, and the, the webinar series that was started really at the end of last year, mm -hmm. we started with just trying to help everybody understand, you know, what is the value of value stream management itself and why is it so important to DevOps, which is near and dear to my heart. Uh, and encourage everybody to take a look at that if you haven't seen it before. And the last webinar really had to do with what I'd call the front end of the engineering DevOps transformation process, which has to do with getting a, bit, a common vision and alignment and then doing an assessment uh, of your current state of your current DevOps environment or whatever you, you know, whatever, from whatever your organization's needs are. Uh, this webinar ties in with the last one. Uh, it sort of takes over where the last one left off. If you're mm -hmm. looking at implementing DevOps uh, and value stream management together, uh, so we're really zooming in on the steps for how you really, you know, build a solution. That doesn't mean that you. It's not the implementation. It's the solution. So in other words, if you like the the, the roadmap, the design, the the components that would make up of value stream management solutions. The next webinar will go into actually implementation of that solution. And finally, you know, what you do after you implement it would be the final webinar. Perfect. So, and you can find those on our on our website um, at, or email me at the end and I'll, I'll get you links to everything. So today, um, we've got some goals. Walk us through, you know, what are the goals? What are we going to get out of today? Well, you know, anything that's, Fun, in my opinion, is something that involves some learning. So hopefully you'll find yep. this a little fun and learn something about value stream management and how you know you can build a solution for that, what the steps are that will pretty much guarantee you a good solution if you follow those steps um, and why those, you know, following the steps is important. Everybody tends to want to jump to the end, but uh, in reality, you want to follow a certain sequence to get to ensure that you've got everything lined up properly. And what's the expected outcome? In other words, what will be the result of going through those steps and what, what do you expect to get out of this whole process? Uh, in particular, how does this tie into the next steps of implementation? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I, uh, the part of the reason we're here is I wanted you to hear what a, you know, if you were to hire Mark or another consultant to come in, you could actually determine the process so that you can follow this process to learn how to sell up. How do you, how you actually get money for a solution to implement so you can help uh, get this in place for your organization to really uh, have a system of a continuous improvement in place. But none of that comes without a cultural change, a, a technology change, and it's going to cost some money and time. How do you do all that? Well, 
this is why this is such an interesting conversation. Um, learn from people that do this all the time, and that's why we're here. So diving in deeper, then we're gonna dive into the process of, of what we're gonna learn. You wanna walk us through what we'll learn? Okay, so you know, first of all, it all starts with why. I mean, nobody cares about anything if you don't really have a, some personal as well as company alignment in terms of interests. And um, so we're gonna talk about you know, why the particular steps that I'm talking about are important. Uh, everybody, again, tends to wanna to jump to a conclusion Right. You know, write the final answer without getting alignment. Uh, so alignment is a large part of the why, but we'll talk about that. And then the how is like, okay, so once you know why you're trying to come up with a solution around whatever the goals were that were determined in the, you know, in the in the assessment stage in the prior webinar, uh, you know, how how are the how do you go about creating a solution? Right. What what is the magic that says, okay, if that's what I want, how do I get it? You know, what, what is it exactly in terms of components, structure, you know, architecture, roadmap, and, you know, plan, if you like, to, to actually get there. And then finally, what's the expected outcome? Um, you might think that that's a little redundant, but really, the, uh, you know, what, what do you end up with at the end of this process of solution mapping? Uh, you end up with alignment. You end up with some artifacts that can be used in the subsequent phase of implementation and you end up with a pretty clear idea of what you know what are the next steps absolutely i always like to think of this process as creating the business case um you, you're going to learn today how to create the business case for uh, implementing uh, determining a value stream management solution and how to get it kicked off so with that let's just dive in so all right why do we need steps? Why not just design a, you know, jump right in and start designing dashboards and a governance and and so forth? But why do we need these steps? Right. So again, the prior webinar talked about vision, visioning, and um, alignment and assessments around your current state and where you want to take, you know, where you want to take the organization and your implementation towards. And uh, so making sure that you end up with a solution match to those current state vision and goals uh, is critical. So it really starts with with that. The output of the prior you know, webinar really mm -hmm. is the input to this one. And if you don't uh, do that, then you know clearly you're not, you're not gonna get to where you wanna go because it's gonna be a random solution. And then the team alignment um, around a future state. So you know, building a future state view based on those goals it's not just um, saying, hey, this is what we want to end up with, but exactly how are we gonna get there and making sure everybody, the sponsors, the implementers, the influencers, the stakeholders uh, are pretty clear of that this is the solution that they want and that they'll buy into uh, and that other alternatives have been considered enough that the, the, you know, the solution that's being recommended is the one they're gonna go with. And finally, you know, if you do that, it really avoids a lot of waste. I've seen so many projects that you get partway into it and you really short short circuited the prior, you know, alignment and, and uh, uh, solution mapping, and you find out you really didn't go the right path. What a waste, right? When you've got right. all, all this effort and tooling and costs, you know, nobody said value stream management or even DevOps is is inexpensive. It's it's a, it's a strategic investment. Is something that is very worthwhile, but you really want to make sure that the investments that you make along the way are the ones that are most important for your your situation. Um, and then getting buy-in from the people that control the you know the budgets. If it's if it's really going to be a substantial, valuable implementation, then presumably it's going to be significant, right? Sizable. It's going to require some investment. And it's probably going to be on be beyond the scope of the you know the the, the budget of an individual department. It's it's going to take some senior sponsorship. Um, portraying that solution and all the components, the systems, and the uh, capital and operating expenses in a way that will be acceptable to the senior stakeholders and finance people is critical. So that that's really important. Uh, and if you don't go through these steps, you won't have the data that will support building the ROI case. 
And finally, you know, there's nothing worse for morale than going through all of this and finding out that you didn't, you know, didn't get a uh, a solution that is going to really match your goals, um, or people maybe don't have alignment around goals. So uh, morale, if you do these steps, you're going to find everybody is happier about what they're doing, why they're doing it, and you know how they're going to get there. And uh, it's much more likely to be a successful project, and everybody's going to be more satisfied. Yeah, and I like the word that you used. I mean, this is a project. And you have to treat it like a project. You need to no. understand your end state. You need to understand what it's going to take to get there, get all the buy-in. I mean, this is you're you're treating basically a uh, implementation of of systems in place as a way of making cultural and tool and 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 process changes that'll affect everyone. And you've got to understand where you're going before you get going. <laughs> uh, ultimately, if you're listening to this webinar you are now responsible for creating the business case because at the end of the day, that's what's important. You've got to bring bi the business visibility to it. So, all right, well, how do you, how do you determine uh, a value stream management kind of solution um, given I'm gonna go through some of that process and, and walk us through this? <clears throat> sure, so this is kind of the big picture blueprint, if you like, for this. Mm -hmm whole uh, process uh, it's not that complicated really but it starts with you know look really analyzing the results of the assessment phase the prior phase where you did vision alignment and leadership alignment and team alignment and you really and built the current our, state prior webinar. yeah yeah mm -hmm. yeah and we explained all that in the prior webinar so we're not going to do that again here but you know really understanding it usually the same people that were involved in creating the current state will also contribute to implementing the future state, although often there's a smaller subset of folks that, you know, really hunker down and try to draft a future state value stream map, and then it's reviewed with the larger team. Uh, it depends on the complexity of it, of course, but um, fundamentally that's, you know, usually there's a few, if you like, subject matter experts, depending on what the, was determined previously of what the goals were and what the priorities were, you may like just take an example. I don't know. Let's say the goal was uh, we want to improve this, the agility, you know, the, t the lead time between you know planning and delivery. So in that case, you know the the, the folks that are involved in um, the you know this effort would would require to understand how to speed things up, and that would also be determined from the current value stream map, where you see where there are delays, and I'll be going through some of that, but the technologies and processes and workflows, you need the expertise involved that are you know pertinent to that. Um, mm -hmm. So once you have a value stream map, then you can determine, okay, what are the tools? Again, that is a lot of expertise, content, and we'll talk about how you select tools. Uh, and then build a transformation roadmap that uh, matches, you know, the value stream map requirements, the goals, to, uh, incorporating the tools, maybe some learning involved, maybe some POCs. Finally, build a backlog of themes and epics and user stories. You know, even though this may seem a little waterfallish in terms of the approach, uh, in reality, you know, all we're trying to do here is, you know, build a really solid. Uh, plan with a lot of buy-in and then mm -hmm. you know the real implementation is certainly you know a, a agile sort of implementation is typically recommended and then before you leave it okay now that you've got all that data build a return on investment case go back to the sponsorship <clears throat> team get alignment and determine next steps yeah i it, really cool too when you can show that <clears throat> you created a backlog and now you've got really an uh, an ROI of, of the improvement. Um, very powerful I, from what I've seen in teams to um, basically, I mean, what a morale booster and justification for the next phase and you'll get to take on more. It's kind of cool. So with that, we're going to jump to a survey question. Uh, we can pop that survey live. This is our first survey question just talking about what extent using values, you know, are you at with uh, using value stream management today? Um, and see if we can get that pushed live or pushed out to folks for just a couple minutes. Is that pushed out? I think so. Yeah, it's pushed out. Excellent. So we'll take just a minute. So just uh, if you can fill in the questions on, on what extent are you using value stream management today? 
what's it look like in your organization? You know, do you not know? Are you just getting familiar? How how far along this path are you? We'll finish this up in about 20 seconds. Okay, maybe not even 20 seconds. Okay, we'll finish this in five, four, three, two, one. Awesome. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, and do you want to show those results really quick? Can we show those? Yes, they're on the screen now. Oh, they are on the screen now. Since you're presenting, you may not see them. Would you like me to, to read them off to you? <laughs> <laughs> I guess since I'm presenting, I don't see them, do I? <laughs> no. Oh, okay. boy. Where, so where are most people at? So the, the top... Uh, response is 47% of people said just getting familiar with VSM. Yep, that's typical. The second highest one, which is pretty close to the third, 21% said plan to implement VSM in the next few years. The third most popular answer was don't know at 18%. Okay. And then the um, uh, then a the 13% for VSM is currently being implemented, already implemented, and then z nobody said no plans to implement. I guess that's why they're on this webinar. Uh, it's probably it. <laughs> awesome. All right. Well, let's get back to it. Let me know when you can see the screen again. We're good to go. Okay. So, you know, it's interesting. Everyone is thinking about what it means and not really sure where to go. That's why this <laughs> webinar is so important. Follow the process. Um, so we need to review results from the assessment. Walk us through that, Mark, because that seems like it's the starting point. So before you before you can build the business case, you got to figure out where you're going, and that's what we talked about. So and with that, we came up with the assessment that was the prior webinar. So walk us through now how we're reviewing the inputs and where we go from here. Yeah, so this is kind of a pricey of the prior webinar almost. Um, you know, the output of the assessment process is. First of all, you, the recommendation is to start with a model application. If you're really just getting going and beginning on your DevOps journey as an organization, if you have already got a few applications, then even still pick you know a small number of applications to really uh, build the enhancements around that you're doing for this particular you know VSM implementation. Uh, so I still think it's relevant to say pick you know look, focus on a few model applications rather than boil the ocean. Um, so make sure that you really have all the data, current state information for those models, uh, you know, whatever whatever that one or set of applications are. Uh, make sure you really clearly understand what tools are being used for those model applications and the current state, what the gaps are in relative to you know, recommended practices that came out of the assessment process. Those are the, I think I call them the nine pillars of DevOps practices. Um, so they're very specific, uh, mm -hmm. and they guide you to where you know where you have gaps relative to what your goal priorities are. Yep. Uh, really understand your current state value stream map, where the bottlenecks are. The bottlenecks should be pretty clear, whether they're uh, you know time-based bottlenecks and non-value-added time uh, between stages, or just you know differences between lead time and process time for individual sure. stages, or even quality gaps uh, where you've got uh, rework happening at each stage that m could be considered waste and essentially a gap. So you really analyze that and try to figure out, okay, given given that analysis, you know, wh where do you want to concentrate a future state solution? Uh, the organization, you know, they, they, it's certainly true that you know, culture leadership uh, is essential to implement DevOps, and generally speaking, it's essential to implementing almost anything complex in an organization, I would say. Mm -hmm. Although DevOps, it seems to be, for some reason, tied to it even more. Um, but you know, again, is the is the organization ready? You know, what's the current state? Are they really ready for a VSM solution, or are there things that are going to need to be changed? So the solution is not only a technology solution. It may be changes required in the culture, or leadership, workflows. Mm -hmm. So we really need to understand that piece. Um, and finally, getting alignment with business goals. So. Uh, nobody really cares about any, you know, project if there isn't a business purpose. If if you're working for a company that 
does care about that, then you're probably not going to be very successful. <laughs> the company's not going to. So, you know, fundamentally, you want to really map the solution to business goals. If you can't figure out, you know, in, in, within the solution how it maps to a business goal, then probably it's something that's either not required or is not the right solution. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is really getting a the output from the prior assessment stage is so important to get it right because if you don't get it right, then you're really dealing with, you know, garbage in, garbage out type of situation where you, you've got to have the right data to start with and you really need to understand it. Who needs to understand it? Well, obviously the people that are assigned to build a solution. It may not be the entire assessment team. It may be a subset of the assessment team. It's usually going to be at least some people that have done it before um, and some of the key stakeholders from probably dev and ops and infrastructure and tools uh, that are going to help build the solution as well as some sponsors are going to be tagged to make sure they approve the solution. Well, and really these are what are going to take us to the next step because as you're reviewing those, you're going to go down the path of creating some kind of tool to align, you know, to get alignment on what our goals are. So walk us through how do we, you know, you got to you gotta put it in some place and you got to need, you need some kind of framework. So walk us through how this works then. So now that I've evaluated all that, I looked at some of the goals, like maybe I'm interested in more agility or stability. How, how do I put that in a way that I can now uh, quantify it? Yeah, this this particular chart was in the prior um, webinar. It's really part of the assessment process, but it's a good reminder because it, even though you come up with you know, forced ranked, if you like, goals, um, you know, as you go through the solution process, you may find out that um, you need to revisit it, but usually it sticks pretty well. I've seen a lot of organizations where it's like, oh, that's our number one goal. That's what the tool is telling us. But in fact, we think we really don't have the time or energy or resources to deal with that. So we'll go to number two instead. And sure. then somewhere along the line, they think, oh my God, we should have stuck with number one because uh, we're not going to get very far if we don't, you know, there's some bottlenecks that we need to resolve first. Um, but, you know, the, the, nevertheless, it is something that you got to keep revisiting. So the, the key is if you take the different kind of goals categories for what I call the six categories of goals for DevOps, agility, stability, efficiency, quality, security, satisfaction, there's specific goals under each of those. And you have certain metrics. You look at the current state, the future state, you know, the gaps, and that gives you a rank, you know, where you've got the largest gap. Um, it will give you an indication of what where you've got the largest rank, and then you can uh, rank those against, um, you know, they're ranked against your goals, so they should, in fact, be honored. Either that or you got, you've, you've misunderstood your own goals. So generally speaking, I do try to, you know, revisit in the uh, solution stage, you know, make sure that you've got these, the these, uh, solution team, which again, may be a subset of the assessment team, really well aligned with, with this chart. So it's worth revisiting it, even though it's, you know, a repeat from the prior assessment presentation. Gotcha. So once you're aligned on this, that takes us to the next step of uh, really, uh, you know, this is where the magic starts happening. This is yeah. where you, okay, you've got your baseline. So um, walk us through this. What, what do we do next? Yeah, so this is where clearly, you know, it's going to take experience and expertise, people that have done it before type folks. Uh, it, it's not going to be just a, out of a book, although I encourage people to buy my book. It'll tell you some ideas. <laughs> but uh, fundamentally, um, you know, you, you look at in, in this particular example, uh, this organization uh, had a COT system and they were trying to figure out how to accelerate their value stream. Um, and the biggest uh, delay, if you look at the, you know, the, the chart at the top, you know, automating the uh, review board, the change uh, board was nine days of manual work. So mm -hmm. that clearly was the biggest bottleneck and that was the first area to attack. So the idea is to walk through each of these stages and say, well, in each of these stages, what could be done to help accelerate and shorten that time? and come up with tactics for that. And the second was, you know, eight days was being consumed and just codifying, or sorry, planning the download, uh, a new release from the COTS vendor. So in this case, you know, the idea was to codify the download. That was the overall idea. Um, and then finally, you know, the, the next priority was to attack the planning for a release of a new COTS environment, which was taking six days. And again, codifying, 
the way the backlog was being handled and coordinating with the supplier a little more. Uh, and then you take those ranks based on the the bottlenecks and map them across the value stream stages and figure mm -hmm. out where you can make the biggest gains. Uh, again, this requires expertise. It's not going to happen uh, without without someone that's done it before and with real knowledge. Um, it can be a consultant. It could be some internal person uh, that has that expertise. So in this case. Um, Something that was nine days, we figured out how to get it down to one days by mostly automating the cab process using value stream management. Uh, something that was eight days, the planning, you know, we got it down to two and a half days by doing things like orchestrating the test environment and the activities around that using value stream management. And then the, the you know, the other one was planning release to codify the backlog so to actually tie in value stream management tasks with things like reviews of backlog. Uh, and that was able to reduce it from six to four days. So we were able to literally chop out quite a lot in the value stream to satisfy the customer's uh, lead time goal. Love it. I, I remember when we were talking through the webinar, you talked about this is typically the phase where uh, people are often surprised. And I remember you talked about, yeah. you know, I, one customer in particular that was surprised around vulnerability and security. You want to tell that story? Well, yeah, I mean, uh, we all have our biases. So even the teams that do these reviews, you know, th there tend to be people with their own personal biases. And sometimes it'll come up that in, the, in this, in that case, it was security ended up being a, a top ranked as, as an area to attack, but there were only a couple of security people in the room <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> The rest of the folks didn't feel competent to deal with it, uh, and the security folks, and just in this particular case, were not really all that vocal. Uh, so they they kind of pushed, shelved it, and said, "No, well, we'll just go on to other things, and we'll just kind of ignore that that came out as a, a top ranked item." And part way through the implementation, they realized they need to go back and really, you know, figure out how to do security because it was it was clearly going to be a problem that they're, they're all they were going to do is add add to their security problem by ignoring it they were mm -hmm. going to instead focus on accelerating releases without addressing their security issues they would have just had more security issues faster um, <laughs> yes <laughs> right. but more is better well wait not necessarily awesome well that i guess that sort of takes us to our next step then which is um uh, you know, looking at the uh, the tactics to support the improvements. So uh, now that we see where we go, we've got some suggestions on what to improve. How do we actually dive in and 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 figure out where to you know uh, to fix it? Yeah. So this is challenging, and you know there are if you if you were to look at my book, I talk about twenty seven critical success factors in any one solution for any one phase of any DevOps transformation. Um, and, you know, that sounds too complex, but I also say in the book, you know, get over it. Uh, this is this is a big picture, you know, thing. Value stream management and DevOps are not not trivial, right? They, they are complex and tools like value stream management tools can help simplify it for the users, but the folks that are implementing it do in fact need to deal with some of those complexities. And one of the dimensions I call the three dimensions of DevOps is, tech, you know, people, process, and technology. So when you're looking at trying to make improvements at every stage in the value stream, don't just look at the technology. That's a mistake I see a lot of people say. Well, we're just going to put in Kubernetes here, or we're going to put in, you know, Chef here or Puppet there, <laughs> without really understanding. Wait a minute, you know, how, what, what about the people? Do they need training? Uh, is the organization structure right? Is it going to be actually make an improvement or is it just going to cause a lot of churn and disruption without, you know, being accepted? Um, similar with processes. So the, the a properly engineered solution really does explicitly consider, you know, those boxes under every one of those value stream items. And of, obviously uh, where there are bottlenecks, that you're going to go after in particular, then th those need to be detailed in, in significant detail. You know, what, what, what are the people and process and technology items that are needed to, to really realize the solution? And that should be part of what ends up in your backlog. It's not just 
you know, a technology backlog. It could be the way you're doing QA in the process. It could be the way you're doing, you know, the way you're doing security. <laughs> Uh, a, lo a lot of factors. Uh, again, this is something that requires expertise uh, to do it right. Uh, you go off half-baked and you're gonna get a half-baked solution and um, you may not get the results that you want. This is so. kind of, I mean, this is really where the rubber hits the road because when you get through all this, you're coming down to get to this point where you're gonna make some some recommendations. So for example, mm -hmm. you know, in, in your experience of doing these sessions, how do you start to identify the tactics that you're gonna take of getting the right process in place to get the people to do the right things and then figure out, uh, what, how do you actually get into that? Yeah, so it's, I I ha take kind of an engineering approach. It's sort of like divide and conquer. You start mm -hmm. with a big picture, which is a kind of a big picture blueprint of the value stream and you progressively refine it until you figure out, you know, where, where are you gonna get the biggest bang for the buck? It's pretty tough to actually guarantee a particular, mm -hmm. you know, result. Uh, but you at least can say, hey, you know what, if we automate this, if we orchestrate that, if we change our processes here, it's going to be a movement in the right direction that's going to be biased towards these particular goals and these particular, you know, bottlenecks. So unless you have really a complete process simulator, and I don't haven't seen too many of them out there, <laughs> uh, I would love to have one actually. That's a little project I'd like to get going on the side. But uh, yeah, especially when you're dealing with you know complex you know multi microservices or multi multiple pipeline portfolios, um, you know it's, it's complex. Really, what you're dealing with is you know expertise and say, yep, okay, if those are your bottlenecks and those are your goals and this is your current state, then here are the things that are most likely going to help you. And but just you know reminder, don't just talk about technology. It's got to be you know, all three dimensions of people, process, and technology. Absolutely, cool. Well, so at this point then, we need to put in some kind of tool that's gonna look at the whole process of, of managing value streams and, and you know, how, how do we do this? What kinds of the tools are available to us and how does it work? So value stream management at itself, the, ma the management tool is one thing and then all of the tools that connect to it to really orchestrate the whole pipeline, whether you have a application release automation orchestration layer underneath it or just directly with other tools. But either way, there's a lot of tools involved, but in this presentation, we're really talking about the value stream management tool. So I'm just trying to clarify that. Um, so as far as value stream management tool, man, tools themselves are concerned, there are a number of choices out there. I mean, I've seen many folks try to grow their own, uh, mm -hmm. do it yourself, uh, probably fairly naive, or maybe they're smaller <laughs> organizations that don't understand the scope of what value stream management really is. And for that, I'd encourage you to go back to the first webinar. <laughs> uh, you know, it's not just dealing with a simple pipeline. We're talking about a whole portfolio, possibly, a, you know, an enterprise portfolio of pipelines, or maybe a, a federated set of pipelines for an application that has multiple components, some of them being microservices, some of them not. So, you know, tool selection, you've got to have tools that are able to do the job. That's the first thing. So technical uh, capability is clearly the first selection criteria, and I'll talk about that in a subsequent slide. Um, if you want to grow your own, certainly if you've got skills in-house, it's possible. Uh, again, if it's a small system, then maybe that's okay. Uh, but generally speaking, they generally out, you out, tend to outgrow your homegrown at some point. So if you do that, be aware you might want to have in mind what is your your you know your your subsequent solution going to look like otherwise you're going to be stuck with that homegrown solution for a long time um, open source it, the directions industry tends to be more and more open source i haven't really seen a whole lot of what i'd say really competent open source tools at this level of value stream management uh, so you know again open source plus a lot of code potentially could do it um, freemium is really just in between um, so i generally don't count that very much other than it's a good way to get started with an enterprise tool sure. uh, and then an enterprise, right? So things like Protoris product. Um, so being familiar with where are those value stream management tools and what those capabilities are. There's lots of reports out there. Uh, you know, Gartner has a good report. Forrester has some reports on what value stream management really is in their, you know, vernacular and what the capabilities and features are that you should be careful about. Uh, I would add to that 
there are other factors in tool selection that are more than technology, even though technology is like I say, the table stakes piece, uh, but there are so many other factors in integrating a tool into an organization. So business factors and just cultural fit and you know fit with the existing tools that you have. Mm -hmm. um, again, you really need to have somebody that has done this before involved in the tool selection. Um, you just give it to somebody that, that has their favorite tool in mind, then yeah, probably not gonna get the, ult the best solution ultimately, unless you get lucky. Right. Um, yeah, kind of funny, you know, we, I think the marketing guy in me, what I typically see most when people come to us at Platora is they've, they started down the path of, they just wanted a dashboard and, and I wanted to see where my, my flow was going. So maybe I've done some minor integration and, and I, I want to now see the analytics of it. And, and now I'm starting to struggle or I'll come at it from a perspective of, I, I haven't figured out how to handle my, my environments that are, you know, not, that are not ephemeral and, um, how do I manage those or um, even the release uh, orchestration side? I haven't figured out how to best to to watch the flow of things. And so uh, those are typically where people start. And as they as they start understanding, well, wait a minute, there's a bigger picture here of understanding the entirety of the flow. I need to understand the flow of features from ideation all the way to production. The story starts to change. Um, which takes us to, you know, what are some of the critical capabilities of a value stream management solution? Yeah, so this is, I think, a repeat of a chart we did before, but just as a reminder, these are the primary, you know, capability sets of a value stream management solution per Gartner in that report there. Um, so overall management of the tool itself and being able to drill down on the information that's presented for the value stream and all the different stages of the value stream, being able to map stages to the tools, is you know, visible outputs. Um, and then tying governance to that so that you can put you know, controls around those outputs and alarms and alerts. Um, having a graphical editor so that you can you know, see things in a visual way because there's a lot of complexity, especially when you get into multi, uh, you know, portfolio of systems rather than just an individual pipeline. Even with one pipeline, it can be complex enough. You know, mm -hmm. analysis and then down here says analytics, so they're kind of related, but, um, you know, being able to do what if scenarios uh, again with the complexity to make decisions for going forward and built in analytics where you can you know, do a lot of that programmatically uh, mapping mapping uh, of the uh, value stream to the tool but also mapping the different tools to each other the integration with other tools uh, visualization uh, is generally just being able to you know at a glance see the metrics that you're most interested in and particular stakeholders may have different interests and so you want to be able to have customizable dashboards and visualization that are stakeholder specific um, role-based views is kind of the same thing in my mind um, common data model is a tough one often that's often the struggle with a lot of these tools is to try to get a common set of data that the value stream management tool can consume um, because there are so many different kinds of inputs that be able to manage the entire value stream from you know planning through to operations and everything in the middle uh, so that having a great a good way to you know commonalize the data model so that you can then use it for the analytics at the value stream management level which you know, i put value stream management at the top level of the overall engineering blueprint uh, for devops um, it's really at the control level of the whole thing and the governance level and then being able to measure measure value as you go along. So those, these are some of the key features that at least Forrester <coughs> calls out. Yep. Um, these are more technical features. They're, you know, uh, you want to make sure that the, whatever tool you select has these capabilities at least sufficiently for whatever your particular re requirement is. Yeah. Yep, I, absolutely. And you know, if you want to read more about this, you can come to Patora website and and download the. Uh, value stream management wave from it. We actually have a reprint from Forrester. Um, by all means, if you have a relationship with Forrester, we can get you connected with uh, the couple of analysts that actually wrote this, um, both Chris and Diego. Um, and frankly, don't go this alone. I mean, there's a lot here for talking about what the value you'll get out of uh, implementing a, a, a control plane over your application delivery. Um, which really takes us 
kind of the next step of, you know, as you've got a list of value stream management tools, how do you start to compare them? And, and how do you, you know, walk through the process of competing one tool versus another? Sure. So unless you've really fixated on one particular tool, which is, you know, sometimes uh, you've already got a pretty good idea. But uh, if, you, if you're going to be comparing tools, it's a good idea to really look at all the major criteria for comparison, which is more than just the technical things we talked about in the last slide. You know, how are you going to deal with maintenance and support? So the source of the tool is going to have a factor there. If it's open source, you're, you're going to have to, you know, be part of the open source community. If it's freemium, you may have some more, you know, less commercial support available. If it's DUI, you're doing it all yourself. Enterprise, of course. So these are just other factors um, that need to be considered beyond just the technical capabilities, um, the costs, of course, the total cost of ownership, compatibility with your your ecosystem, uh, you know, in your deployments environments. Uh, whether it's in the cloud or on-site or wherever, whatever it is, how easy is it to use considering your particular users? How important is that? And general administration, you know, do you, what kind of administration capabilities do you have? How important is it that the tool has a lot of self-administration capabilities? Um, functional requirements are more of the technical ones, but also don't forget the non-functional requirements, things like performance and reliability and all the other illities that go along with any tool choice. Mm -hmm. uh, does the roadmap, you know, no tool does everything. And there's always a roadmap for the future because this world of DevOps changes so quickly anyway. Make sure that you've got an ability to evolve with the changes as they go along and overall support. So those, uh, you know, each of those should be weighted and uh, compared to, to make a justify the choice. Very good. We're supposed to have a survey, but we're running out of time. So I'm going to just bounce through that and just hit the next one so you know after you've selected a tool or two <laughs> what what do you do yeah so if you select even one you you may if you're not really familiar with it already or maybe some people on your team are not familiar with it already you might want to take a couple of you know important use cases and walk them through a pr proof of concept it wouldn't be a bake-off at that point it would be just you know prove to yourself that it can do it um, or if you have multiple vendors possible, then it is more of a bake-off. But again, the, the, don't short circuit this process. Make sure that you've got a pretty clear understanding of you know, what it is you're trying to get out of the tool, that you've really got those use cases agreed across the team. Um, bring, make sure the vendors are aware of what they are and ahead, ahead of time. You know, it's not a, it shouldn't be a secret. Uh, you know, if you end up with a vendor, you're gonna, they're going to be a partner. So make sure that they're you know, integrated together with your POC. Uh, process and um, you know document as you go make sure that you know if you have multiple vendors what you don't want to do is uh, you know get in a bun fight with with one of the vendors in the end when you say well you, you know these guys were chosen and you're not but we're not going to tell you why it should be a professional uh, above board well documented process uh, you still nevertheless have to be careful about sharing you know confidential and proprietary information so make sure you've got you know, NDAs in place and um, you agree ahead of time what the tests are going to be and so there's no big surprises to the vendor or you know your own team uh, and the end result should be pretty clear from the get-go what, what you're going to end up with so even if the, a vendor is not chosen at least they get to learn something from the process and so everybody gets something out of it and right. in particular you get a choice that you can feel comfortable with you're not going to change out your VSM layer very frequently. <laughs> you know, once you chose a VSM tool, it should be pretty sticky. If you've chosen the right one, you're going to want to hang in with it for quite a while. It's at the top level, like I say, of the whole DevOps, you know, blueprint. And uh, if you choose the right one, it's good. You're going to you're going to use it for a long time. Absolutely. Well, which takes us to sort of the next step is once you pick the tool, you've got to figure out how you implement it. Walk us through right. that. So this is a very grueling, you know, detailed process to say, all right, if those if those are the right tools and those are the right goals and and, and steps, then you know, for each of the people, process, and technology components, uh, what are we actually going to do on a, on a on a use on a use case basis? So you you break it into a plan. It's basically a planning exercise. Involve the project management team. Uh, decide, you know, what. What are the epics? What are the themes? And get all the way down to user stories and you know, implementation 
uh, assignments like who who would do what if you haven't got it to this level then you really don't have a solution you're mm -hmm. kidding yourself if you haven't taken the the the, the uh, solution down to an, an implementable solution you won't know the cost for example uh, and that's critical to, to define an ROI case if you don't know the cost you certainly can't define the return on investment and if it's a significant project then I don't know how you get approval unless the approvers really are just going to go on your word, which may happen, I guess. But for the most part, you're going to learn a lot yourself when you break it down to this level of detail. So, and as soon as you have approval, then you can start implementing because now you've got all the user stories already ready to go. Mm -hmm. um, so this is not to be short circuited in my opinion, you know, build, spend a significant amount of time. It may take a good portion of the, uh, of the entire solution, um, process um, you know maybe even half of the time is is to build the the um, you know the roadmap with this level of detail well and that is sort of from the prior session it's like what once i've know my goals i have a general idea of what the epics are then i can start mm -hmm. to you know turn that roadmap into real work so um uh, talk to me about building you know creating real work from the roadmap yeah, so it's just not, it's really just building a backlog uh, similar to any other, you know, agile centered, you know, agile driven project. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, again, not just the technical pieces, not just the application piece, but, you know, the pipeline, the infrastructure, the, you know, the, the um, applications and all three dimensions of those people, process and tech. So make sure you've got all of that covered in the backlog so that there's no big surprise and you know who's going to do what. Until you get to this stage, you really haven't finished the work. Yeah, you know, and I think a particular interest here are things that at least I hear. Um, walk through the integrations to make sure that you know what's gonna integrate to what and why. Make sure that you have an understanding of some of the key scenarios of, of usage. You know, if, if, if the goal is to find bottlenecks, then great, here's how we're gonna be able to find the bottlenecks and, and include those in your user stories because you can, uh, you'll be able to get them. That's what's yeah. important. You know, here's the dashboards and who's going to be able to use them. They'll set up for what you need to make sure it gets implemented, which is cool. Yeah. Um, so kind of following that along, I mean, if you turn that in, I think there's an interesting aspect of uh, in, in every tool that's been implemented or every process change, there's a final step that seems to be missed, which is justification. It's like, how do we do? And I thought it was really kind of fun when we were talking about this return on investment idea. Um, I, you know, this is the business case. So how do you build the business case showing what did we do and, and um, did it work well? I've been through a few of these, all right. And a lot of, and some, and enough failed ones that, you know, I have some words of warning. <laughs> Certainly if you're going to build, present a business case to business leaders that have budget responsibility and finance folks and that, uh, then it needs to be in a terminology they get. It needs to be credible from their point of view. Mm -hmm. Don't just assume that you know what their view is. They may have already uh, some, typically an organization will already have a threshold for an ROI in any project. If you walk in to a, you know, a meeting and say, I want to get approval and you've got an ROI of like two to one and the organization's ROI threshold is maybe 10 to one, you know, they're going to ask you, why, why did you come to the meeting? Why are we wasting our time? You know, so a lot of the time engineering, you know, they don't really have a good understanding of those things. So, you know, this is the time when you do walk over to the finance department and say, what are your ROI rules? You know, what do you think is credible or not? What I found most credible in these types of projects is, you know, look at the, the you know, with and without picture, right? If you didn't have the solution versus if you have the solution mm -hmm. and look at things that are very tangible. Uh, typically, finance is looking at a return on investment period is more than just the time of the project. It's over the period of, let's say, three years is something when a, what, a, what a, you, you need to find out what is that number? What, what is their event, hor their horizon for projects typically? Is it three years, two years, 18 months? Whatever it is, make sure you understand what that is. Make sure you understand what their ROI threshold is. And if you can't figure out how to you know, meet that threshold, then either your data is wrong or you really shouldn't be doing the project in that organization. Uh, but for the most part, you know, if you think about it, you'll find out that there are labor savings, there are, you know, savings in systems or the capital depreciation costs, you know, capital ex 
uh, expenditures can be depreciated over time and um, all of those rules when you're built into a formula you'll come up with an ROI that hopefully will be something that the you know the, the business leaders and finance folks can accept as you know a legitimate and attractive uh, for the most part I find if this is done right it's usually not a problem to get good ROI and then you get into a different kind of you know discussion like well if this has great ROI and uh, you know we could build a new truck and it has good ROI too so which one do we want to do you know mm -hmm. th those are things you maybe don't have control over there may be other projects that you don't have you know visibility for that are also coming to the same people um, but you know at least make sure you present the case the best you can in the structure and language that you know the people that need to consume it can understand it and 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 accept as a you know a, as a result that they can consume and um don't just you know jump into the meeting without an ROI and ask for money. Generally, it doesn't work. So that really takes us into the recommendation alignment. You know how do you, how do you get consensus on the final solution then? Right. So get the stakeholders in a room. Um, if they're not <laughs> available, then reschedule the meeting. <laughs> well, they don't have to be in a room. They can be in a virtual room like this one. But uh, you know, and, and walk through the key results. You know, how did you get here? What, what was the current state? The solution requirements. This is a very short presentation. These people are, are impatient people, but uh, walk them through the process. Make sure they understand what the recommendation is, what the ROI is, and um, just uh, draft some next steps. Some of those next steps may be things that the sponsors themselves need to do. They need to allocate budget, or maybe they need to, you know, uh, do some things at their end. Uh, but before you leave the room, make sure you've got at least a few next steps defined so that it's a live project at that point. Get a decision, all right? If there is it a go or a no go? If not a go, if it's an unknown, not, not a go or a no go, then you know make sure those next steps are pretty clear of what what is going to be required to get that decision. And hopefully, if it is a go, then the next steps are really to set it up for the next phase which is um, you know, the implementation phase, which is the next webinar. Absolutely. Well, and that takes us to you know, walking through the next steps. You know, give us some uh, guidance around the next steps. Yeah, these um, pretty common sense things. You know, make sure that the next steps are very specific, defined, that you know, you know who's responsible and that they're measurable. This is not specific to VSM at all, but uh, just a reminder, you know, you really don't have a clarity around next steps if you don't have for, if you like every action item or every next step, these things specific, measurable with clear person responsible. Um, and the measurable would be things like a date or something that, you know, is literally measurable. Yep. We're going to, yeah. we, we have a, uh, another survey which we're going to skip, but just to walk through the what. So, um, can you tell us the end state? What when we get all done with this process, what what's happened? Sure. So the ultimate, you know, what that you have when you're done with this is you've got alignment, right? Which is probably the most important thing. The sponsors, the the implement the the solution team hopefully involves some of the people that will be involved in implementation, which is important. Uh, they'd be in agreement that that is a good solution and that it's worthwhile um, and there would be artifacts so the things like the backlog would be you know give a lot of clarity of what what's really needed to implement and the next steps would guide you to the you know to, to onwards to the implementation phase so that's really the what right the, what you end up with if you walk through all these steps it sounds kind of laborious and grueling but this, this whole series of steps I walk through doesn't have to take a long time. I mean, it can be literally measured in days, not weeks, if you really concentrate your efforts and get the people involved. If they're not buying into it, then it can drag out. And that, that, that tends to be why these things that are egg out. It's not that it's necessarily all that complex. It's just trying to get everybody on the same page and participating in the time frame you want them to. But right. if you do that, you're going to get a much stronger, you know, buy-in. You're going to have a lot. You can be a lot happier with the result ultimately. And I bet there's a place I can go to read more about uh, engineering DevOps. Well, yeah, that's the book I mentioned. I'm <laughs> actually publishing 
uh, book. I've been doing DevOps, I think, for 40 some years, long before it was called DevOps. And Jeff, yeah, I know you previewed the book and you have some uh, complimentary comments there, but the standard idea of the book is that it's a blueprint for doing DevOps using engineering practices. Uh, I, I'm just so frustrated with hearing people say, you know, I need, I need to do DevOps, but I don't really know what it is, or maybe we're doing DevOps, I think, but we're not getting the results. You know, how do you do it? I mean, let's get down to you know, details. So this book tells you, you know, it gives you blueprints, it gives you uh, engineering practices and a transformation blueprint that will help you get from wherever you happen to be to all the way to maturity level five DevOps, you know, continuous improvement, uh, if you follow the steps. And so I'm, I'm trying to portray in this book how to do that uh, and reframe DevOps as an engineering problem with an engineering solution. It's, it's not just a computer science uh, project where you're trying to, you know, artfully create an application. This is really about the, you know, the, if you like, the mechanisms and machinery underneath that mm -hmm. to build and uh, maintain and support applications. In my mind, DevOps really ought to be categorized more as engineering than general computer science. Whoops, sorry about that. Um, so if you want a copy, you know, it's not available right now, but you can send in your email at that address, engineeringdevops.com, and when it's available, you get notified. Excellent. Which brings us to why Platora is here. Hey, we're one of the solutions, one of the tools you can implement that help you manage your value streams. Um, uh, if you want to learn more about that, boy, if I can keep this thing from clicking, I don't know why it's clicking. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, highly recommend get involved. Get uh, Even send me an email. I've got all sorts of information I can give you on this topic. Um, we've got other webinars, but the... This is a very hot area right now, and lots of people are saying, like you saw in the survey, we want value stream management, but we're not really sure what it is. Um, let me show you how much you can actually get out of it. Our value stream management platform is a number of different layers that help you in this process of interconnecting your tools and giving you management and orchestration, and ultimately giving you the uh, role-based dashboard analytics and help in the decision-making of what you're doing. The goal is to have us, you know, to help software delivery move faster wherever you are. We need a system of continuous improvement being the most important thing you can implement because wherever you are, you can improve. Um, and so with that, I'm going to see if we have, we have just a couple minutes. We probably have time for just like one or two questions. Actually, we're almost out of time. Actually, we are out of time. I better turn the time over to you, Mitch. Um, and, uh, uh, go from there. If we have any time after that, we can we can do a question if we end up with any extra. Okay, great. I'll I'll try to get through this pretty quickly here. But but thanks to both of you, a fantastic presentation, and I appreciate the the thought and planning, both in Plator's product and also Mark and your experience about how to adopt this and get business alignment. So just a reminder, Mark's book is available at www.engineeringdevops.com. You're available to reserve for now. By the way, I love your handle, DevOps the Gray. <laughs> That's awesome. So we'd also like to announce our the winners of the 50 <laughs> Yeah, so you've earned those gray hairs, I'm sure. <laughs> yes. I'd like to also announce our winners of the $50 Amazon gift cards. Our congratulations to a go to our three winners, Bob P, Jessica L, and Tom A will be in contact with you about how, to, how you'll receive those. Just a reminder, you'll be able to get the contents, the recording and slides at devops.com. We'll be sending out an email to everyone also. So I just want to thank both you and Mark um, and Jeff for uh, your presentations today, uh, and also to Plutoria, of course, for sponsoring the webinar. Uh, would you like to go ahead and, Jeff, see if you want to fit in a couple of questions from our audience at this point? Sure. Um... There's, uh, gosh, <laughs> there's a lot. If you have deeper questions, there's my email address. I'd keep the conversation going. Would love to talk to you more. Um, how does VSM align and or contrast to ITIL v4? Um, great question from John. We actually have a blog that we're just putting up on that exact topic. Uh, there's a lot to be said about ITIL. ITIL is part of the transition framework from an operations point of view. Value stream management is much broader as it looks at 
value streams from idea all the way to production. And it includes some of the uh, ITIL kind of thinking. You can wrap it on top of scaled agile. You can wrap it on top of just lean practices. You can intermix all of them. That's the point is it's agnostic. Um, one of the things that value stream management does with governance is it gives you a way that you can um, have a, a system of compliance and risk management and um, uh, uh, you know uh, audit, if you will, that's matched to loosely coupled teams, which is uh, which is really the where ITIL has a hard time managing. Uh, ITIL does great when you're dealing with monolithic um, big, but has a really hard time with these smaller loosely coupled teams. When you end up in that world, you really need a, a system in place that can help touch every team regardless of where they are. And that's where you'll come to, you know, value stream management kind of tools. Oh, wow, we're over time. Great. Well, we'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Again, thanking Mark and Jeff, and we appreciate your time for being with us. Have a great day and be careful out there. Thanks.